testing. I don't have to talk to Bill. I'll be back. He's going to adjust it. We have a new device. Can you turn it down a little? He's working on it. The last microphone that I had like this, every time I bent down, it went out. So we're going to see if this new device works better. How was that? He could go down just a little bit more because I project pretty, pretty good. How was that? That's good. There you go. What we're going to be dealing with today is present truth. Everybody like that? Now, present truth in what we just read. There's some things in there that we're going to deal with in just a little bit. This is actually a first part of a three-part series that I'm going to do. And it's going to be on the most important subject in all of Scripture by far. There's no other subject more important than the one we're going to talk about. And that's the sanctuary. We're told by the Spirit of Prophecy, and I'm going to show you some quotes in just a few minutes, that each one of us need to understand the sanctuary message. And we're not going to have the faith to stand at the end. Now, I want the faith, you guys. And I want to understand it. So we're going to go through it for the next three times. But for today, a lot of, a lot of times people say, well, where are we? I want to know, when is How close are we to see Jesus coming? Because Jesus has given us some signs in the Bible to warn us and, and to show us how close we are to his coming. You'd like to know how close we are, wouldn't you? What are you going to do about it if you find out? That's another good question, isn't it? So let's take a look at the passage that we have. In fact, I added stuff to this passage. It says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black, like sackcloth, made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars fell to earth as late figs drop as fig trees when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And the scripture we had this morning was this, that the kings of the earth and the princes... The generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And here's what I want you to think about. And who can stand? Because not everybody is going to be able to stand. Because when Jesus comes, his glory will destroy the wicked. And those that are standing are those that are like him. They have his character. In fact, they're going to have his character before Jesus comes. The Bible says that. But I want you to look at a couple things. It says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. And this great earthquake, actually, it says here, when God made the sun, moon, and the stars of creation, he says, let them be as signs for seasons and for days and years. So we should not be surprised to find God giving us signs of his return to the heavens. He planned it from the beginning. Let's look here. I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great what? Now I'll tell you, the Lisbon Portugal earthquake, Portugal earthquake in November 1, 1755, it says the sixth seal opens with a great 
convulsions of the earth, one of the most extensively felt earthquakes ever recorded occurred in 1755. It is sometimes called the Lisbon earthquake or the great earthquake of Lisbon because the greater part of that city was destroyed with a loss between 60 and 90,000 lives. In fact, the sea rose to a 50 feet and in some areas over 80 feet above the ordinary level. Now, this is amazing because it affected three continents. The great earthquake of November 1, 1755 extended over a track of at least four millions of square miles. It pervaded the greater portions of the continents of Europe, Africa, and America. Robert Sears, Wonders of the World, Unfolding the Revelation. Up to this point in human history, this earthquake was the, probably the greatest natural disaster since Noah's flood. Now, what did Jesus say would happen just before he comes? There'd be a great earthquake, wouldn't there? And then what, did he, what else did he say? He says, there was a great earthquake, but the sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. Does anybody remember the dark day of 1780? Have you ever heard of that before? The dark day of 1780, almost if not altogether alone, is the most mysterious and as yet unexplained phenomenon of its kind in natural's diversified range of events stands the dark day of May 19, 1780. Dash a most unaccountable darkening of the whole visible heavens and almost in New and uh, atmosphere in New England. That's in our first century, page 80, 90, 90. Noah Webster in his American Dictionary of the English Language edition says of the dark day, the true cause of this remarkable phenomenon is not known, and it's not. But I will tell you, I have people telling me all the time, well, you know, that was that dust storm that came from Canada. No, I'm serious. And, you know, I don't care what it was that did it because Jesus just said it would happen. I don't care how it happened. So we had a great earthquake. Now we have a dark day. But then tells us that the whole moon turned blood red. Well, on the same night, you guys, on the same night, the night of the dark day was so black, a piece of white paper could not be seen when held directly in front of the eyes. Now, I got that from a historian who was actually there at the time, and he wrote about it. But he said you could hold a piece of paper in front of you, and it was so dark. And what's amazing, you guys, it was at noon in the daytime when it happened. It wasn't at night. It was in the daytime. All the cattle came in, they said. The roosters, the chickens were coming in. People looked for the moon, but like the sun, it was blacked out. At about midnight, unusual darkness lifted, and the moon appeared, but it was as red as blood. Milo Baswick says of this event, the moon, which was at its full, had the appearance of blood. The alarm that it caused and the frequent talk about it impressed it deeply on my mind. Stone's History of Beverly, Massachusetts. Now, not only did we have an earthquake, in the dark day, and the moon turned into blood, but Jesus says in the same passage, what else would happen? The stars would fall, wouldn't it? Well, in 1833, okay, November 13, 1833, the morning of November 13, 1833, was rendered memorable by an exhibition of the phenomenon called shooting stars, which was probably more extensive and magnificent than any similar one hitherto recorded. Probably no celestial phenomena has ever occurred in this country since its first settlement, which was viewed with so much adm admiration and delight by one class of spectators, or with so much astonishment and fear by another class. In fact, they thought the end of the world was here. It was recorded. They thought the world was coming to an end. For some time after the occurrence, the meteoric phenomenon was the principal topic of the conversation in every circle, American Journal of Science and Arts. Of this event, Charles A. Young, a professor of astron astronomy at Princeton University, says, 
Probably the most remarkable of all the meteoric showers was that of the Lenins on November 12, 1833. The number was estimated as high as 2 million hitting the ground, falling to the earth every hour. An hour for five or six hours. Can you imagine? Has anybody heard this before? Well, what's interesting, they had somebody paint some pictures of what it looked like there at the time. You could look it up on the internet too. There's hundreds of pictures like this. What's interesting is this, as I watched as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, the sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair, the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars fell to earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. It's amazing that each one of these events took place exactly the way that God listed it in the Bible. First the earthquake, then the dark day, the moon, and then the shower of stars. What's amazing is this is where we are right now. We are living here between verse 13 and 14. Because the very next thing in verse 14 is Jesus coming in the clouds. It is. Let's read it. It says, The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island were removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave, every free man hid in the caves and mo among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? I see people shaking their heads like, what is this? Are you serious? This is God's word, you guys. It is. It's God's word. And he's telling us this. What's interesting is that we're living right now between the signs that he showed us and Jesus coming in the clouds. How close do you think we are? Now, I want to tell you something. I teach Daniel and I teach Revelation and I have for 40 years. There are some things that I know of in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation that has to happen just before Jesus comes. And during these next two times I'm up in front of you here, I'm going to share those with you so that you'll know when you see those things happen, you know we're right at the door. In fact, we're right at the door right now. Jesus is going to come soon. But the point I want to make is who is going to be able to stand? Because only those, you know what's interesting? When the brightness of Jesus comes, only the only ones he affects and destroys is the wicked those that have sin in their lives. The ones that don't have sin in their lives, it doesn't affect them. It says, those who would share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. The precious hours, instead of being given the pleasure to display or to gain seeking should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful study of the word of truth. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by who? By the people of God. Are you, you guys are part of God's people here, aren't you? So, so this right here tells us um, from great controversy, the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God all need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to feel. The subject of the sanctuary I was telling you is the most important subject. And why would it be, Harlan? 
Why is the sanctuary so important is because it's the vehicle that God uses to take sin out of our lives. It does. That's what the sanctuary does. Remember how they used to walk the lamb? Almost three quarters of a mile from the different, different campsites. The sanctuary was right in the middle of the tribes of, of Judah. Levi, Reuben, all those tribes. And every time somebody sinned, they would walk three quarters of a mile with a little lamb. And you know what's amazing about the sanctuary? Did you know or ever think about that God accepts a substitute for us? Isn't that great? Isn't that amazing? God says that he'll accept a substitute for our sins. And that little lamb, when they walked it along, that little lamb, they came to the entrance of the gate, the priest was there, and the sinner would put his hand on the lamb and he would confess his sin. And his sin symbolically would go from him to the lamb. And then the sinner himself would take the knife and get under the, the lamb's throat and he would cut it, the throat, and the priest would catch the blood. That's why we sing that song, there's power in the blood. Right? And they would take the blood and it would go in and they would sprinkle it on the altar of incense in the holy place. And the smoke that came from that blood and the merits of, of the lamb would go and, and go up over the top of the curtain, which was about 14 feet tall, and it would go in and God would look in favor on that sinner and his sin would be forgiven. So now we don't sacrifice lambs anymore, do we? No, but, but there is a lamb of God. In fact, John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and he told the disciples, he says, there he goes, there's the lamb of God right there. Jesus is the Lamb of God, and every single time you confess your sins, what does Jesus say he'll do? 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you for those sins and cleanse you from what? You guys, this is all unrighteousness. He's not going to cleanse you just from one sin. He's going to cleanse you from all of it. Well, wait a second. I don't know if I remember my sins way back then. When I, when I was 9 and 10 years old, you guys, I was a wild one. I got whipped a lot. In fact, I got whipped more than anybody else in my family, and there were nine in my family. In fact, I was the last one to get whipped by my dad. I'm not bragging about it. I just want to tell you that I, too, am with you here. I created a little bomb. I built this little bomb, this gas bomb. And my brother came around the corner and saw me with it. I was getting ready to light it. And he said, I'm dead on you, and that was it. Because I knew that night my dad told me he was going to whip me, but he let me go through supper, let me eat dinner first, and think about it. He, he was never angry, and, 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 and he, would, he would never just grab me and just whip me. He would just let me think about it a minute, a little bit more. <laughs> and, you know, and then, then, he, then he would do his, his work. Um, and sometimes if he didn't have a belt, he'd tell me, go get a switch. And as I'm going out there, he'd yell at me and make sure it's a good one or I'll go get one. No kidding. Anybody's mom and dad was like that? Yeah, several of you here. Well, praise be to God that I'm in front of you right now because of my mom and dad. I remember just as a little kid, my mom used to read us Bible story books. But the thing is this, is the thing is this, is that understanding the sanctuary message is so powerful. And the sins that we've done in the past, if the Spirit of God doesn't bring it to your attention, then move on. You pray about it, Lord. If I've done anything to harm anybody, please bring it to my attention and watch what happens. Watch what you start remembering. You want to get all sin out of your life? 
Pray that prayer. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus says that I will forgive you for all unrighteousness. You guys, what a blessing. And I can stand in the presence of God. I can go on my knees. And there are many times you go on your knees afraid, but I've never seen anybody come off their knees afraid. Because you give it to God. You give it everything to him. And, and, and if you're asking him, Lord, if I've done anything, show me what I've done to, to, um, that I've hurt somebody. And I'll tell you what, you might need to write a letter to somebody. Or you might even need to make a phone call. Frank, some of those people in Chicago, you might need to contact them. Yeah. By the way, I lived outside Chicago at the same time. I didn't go into Chicago because Frank was there. <laughs> no, the amazing thing is this, is that I remember having a, I had a Bible class for almost a year and a half. There were 18 of them every, every single Tuesday night. And I brought this up to the class and I told them, I said, you know, you want to ask for forgiveness. You want to you bring everything to the foot of the cross. You want to lay everything out, lay all on the altar. And let God take everything and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And I had a young girl tell me, she came back to class the following week. She drove three hours. No kidding. This young girl drove three hours. Some of you might have heard this story. But she went up and she knocked on this door and this other young girl came out and she asked for forgiveness the way her and her friends used to treat this girl in high school. And they embraced there. They hugged each other. They cried. And she came back and told us that they, they're friends now. Isn't that amazing? See what God can do for you. All who have truly repented of sin and by faith claimed the blood of Christ as their atoning sacrifice, have had pardon entered against their names in the books of heaven. Well, isn't, isn't that a blessing, you guys? It's a great controversy. Chapter 28, as they have become partakers of the righteousness of Christ. Now, wait a second. How does that happen? How does that happen how do you partake of Christ's righteousness? In fact, one of the greatest passages in all Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says there that God made him... Look with me there. Open your Bibles. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5. This is so good, you guys. This is absolutely one of my favorite in all Scripture. Are you there? It says, God made him who had no sin to be what? To be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what happens is, you guys, when I confess my sins, when you confess your sins, your sins leave you, and they go on, on Christ, okay? He becomes sin for us, and we take his righteousness, and that becomes part of my life, and I can actually confess my sins right now and stand before you holy and acceptable. That's what the Bible says. I give him my sin, he gives me his righteousness. Man, isn't that a great move? Wow. God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might have his righteousness. So here, become partakers of the righteousness of Christ and their characters are found to be in harmony with the law of God. Their sins will be blotted out and they themselves will be accounted worthy of what? Of eternal life, you guys. When I confess my sins to Jesus, this is how it works. This is what the sanctuary message is. It's the, it's the most important message in all the Bible. 
And look, it says, the Lord declares by the prophet Isaiah, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. By the way, you guys, in the sanctuary, sin is always transferred. I know the Bible says, well, it's thrown to the deepest part of the ocean and it's gone forever. Well, that's a, that is what you call a, um, um, man, the word just, just slipped me. But let me just tell you, the sin is always transferred. It's transferred from the sinner to the lamb, and then it's transferred from the lamb, which is Jesus. When he comes out, he gives it to who? He gives it back to Satan. He does. In fact, that's the scapegoat. Remember the Lord's goat on the Day of Atonement? The Lord's goat, and then there's a scapegoat. Has anybody ever been called the scapegoat? Come on, you guys. I have too. I have. I've been called the scapegoat. In fact, the scapegoat in the Hebrew means, it's a, the word is hazazel. It means the evil one. The hairy one in the Hebrew. So what's interesting is that my sin on the Day of Atonement, the Lord's goat, all the sins that are in the sanctuary are transferred from the sinner to the sanctuary, and it goes from the sanctuary, and the high priest comes out with it. And as he comes out, he comes out and he puts his hand on the scapegoat in the sanctuary, and all the sins for all year long that have been brought to the sanctuary are now given back to the scapegoat. And the fulfillment of that is when Jesus comes out of the clouds of glory, when he comes down, he's bringing with him, that's what he's doing right now. He's cleansing the sanctuary. We're in the anti-typical day of atonement right now. That sounds like a big word, anti-typical. Well, anti just means opposite. It's the opposite of the typical, so it means it's the real thing. Jesus will be, when he comes, it will be the real thing. And he's going to bring all the sins that everybody confessed all the sins that you've asked for to be forgiven are in the heavenly sanctuary. They're there. And they're going to be brought back out. And they're going to be given back to Satan. And he's going to die for it. Yep. But look at this. Sins that have not been repented of and forsaken will not be pardoned. Does anybody know what the unpardonable sin? Did you know the unpardonable sin is not one specific sin that you can look at? It's because you never asked for forgiveness. It can never be pardoned. So any sin can be the unpardonable sin. Only those sins, that the sins that have not been repented of and forsaken will not be pardoned and blotted out of the books of record but will stand to witness against the sinner in the day of God. Now, let me ask you, can you think of any sin that God can't forgive? You see, he can forgive all of it. If you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you. Isn't that clear, you guys? Some of us might be needing to go back home this afternoon and get on our knees and ask God to forgive us and to help us to remember the things that we've harmed people or hurt somebody and watch what God does for you. He'll bring it to your attention. And if he does it, move on. Stand in the presence of God holy and acceptable and move on you know, and fight the battles with Jesus because he'll help you. He will. Satan invents unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds that they may not dwell upon the very work with which we ought to be best acquainted. The arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring into view an atoning sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice. He hates it. He doesn't want anybody to talk about it. He doesn't want anybody to mention the power that Jesus has in your life. He hates it. He's a liar. Yeah. 
Manchita. You guys don't know what that is, do you? I'm learning a little bit of Portuguese. Manchita is a liar. You're a liar. Wonder who told me that. <laughs> you know how I know? Because you go, Manchita, Manchita. I said, hey. The arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring into view an atoning sacrifice and an all-powerful mediator. He knows that with him, everything depends on his diverting minds from Jesus and his truth. Right? All who have received the light upon these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of men. You guys, the sanctuary in heaven right now, Jesus is working for you, each one of you. Your names are going to be brought up soon. Did you know ever since Adam and Eve, since 1844, ever since Adam and Eve, Daniel 8 and 9, tells you that the, the judgment began in 1844, and we know it. It's the greatest prophecy ever told in Scripture, but now we know it began in 1844, the judgment, every name of every single person, every man, woman, and child that had ever lived and is buried right now, whether they're righteous or whether they're wicked, their names are going to come up. By the way, only the righteous names are coming up now because the wicked are judged later during the thousand years. Did you guys know that? Revelation 20. So judgment begins at what? The house of God, right? Frank, it begins at the house of God. So then it says, it opens the view to plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphal issue of the contest between righteousness and sin it is of the utmost importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer to everyone that asketh them a reason of the hope that is in them. Wow. Who can stand? You know, I... I wanted to share one thing with you that we all should do, and I want, you to, I want you to repeat this all with me together, okay? The next slide. Repeat it with me. This prayer. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen. Who can stand? Those who make it a practice every day to do these things that I'm going to give you right now. Okay? But I'm going to prove this in Scripture, and I'm going to prove it through the sanctuary that this is true, what I'm going to show you, okay? Okay? So first of all, those who make it a practice every day to repent of your sins. 1 John 1, 9. Every day, make it a habit to bow on your knees, confess your sins. If tomorrow you don't have any, hey, bow down on your knees and get to know Jesus a little bit. Remember what Jesus said? I never knew you, so get away from me. But Lord, I did all these great things. Yeah, but I never knew you. Get away from me. Get to know him, right? And that's what the next one is. Know him, John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they might know him, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. To know him. You know him through prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says what? Pray without... We learned that in our Sabbath school today. Pray without ceasing. And you guys, look. It's not walking around like this all the time bowing on your knees or walking around like this. No, it's being in such a state of mind that nothing comes between you and Jesus. Nothing does. You're always focusing and walking with him 
doing things with him, whether it's work or play or whatever you're doing, driving down the road. Have a talk with him. Get to know him. Bible study, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved. Right, Frank? Right, the right word of truth. Share Jesus with others. So, we're going to repent of our sins every day, know him every day. We're going to do it through Bible study. We're going to do it through prayer. We're going to do this every day, right? Because we're going to get to know him. And then we're going to share Jesus in all his wonderful things. You know, I did that the other night. I had to ask an Uber to come and pick me up so I could get my truck out of the back parking lot here. I had fixed it. Thanks to... uh, the mechanic back here, he's Jesse, he's, he, uh, he knows his stuff real well. But he's busy. He's, he's busy. No, but think about this now. So I'm, I'm driving along, I'm sitting in the back, and she's driving, and she starts pouring out her heart, I mean, about all the things that's happening to her all day long. And I shared several passages with her from God's Word. I shared her some stuff, and I I showed her a couple of passages of prophecy and how the Bible compares it with another one, with another scripture, the scripture. And she stopped. She turned around. She looked at me. She goes, where are you kidding? I says, hey, it's right here in the the Bible. I says, I'll tell you what. Why don't we do a Bible study? She goes, I'd love one. I'd love to have a Bible study. She goes, can I ask my mom to come too? And I says, well, sure, you can ask your mom to come too. So I've got a a Bible study with two people set up just by saying a few things, quoting a few little scriptures and trying to help her along. You could do the same thing. I don't have the corner on that, you guys. You guys could do the same exact thing. The Bible says, Go ye therefore into all nations, teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It says that in Matthew 28. That's it for today, you guys. You know, I know you want some more. (laughs) You know, God is good, isn't he? The Bible is very, very, very powerful, and it's mighty. And I'll tell you what, we turn our lives over to him and let him do some things in our life that you can't even imagine. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we're so very thankful we're here today. We're so very thankful for your word and the, and the, the truth that you have shared with us. Father, we know you're coming soon. We know your son Jesus is coming in the clouds and he's coming back to get us. Amen. Oh, Father, I pray for each person here. I pray for the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray for the angels to surround us with their presence to protect us. Satan hates what we're doing. He hates it with passion. Father, as we leave this place, I pray that you go with us and protect us. Protect their family members, protect their children. And Father, today I also ask for the power of your Holy Spirit to be in our class that we're having this afternoon. Pray for your spirit to be there also. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for being our God. You deserve our worship. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Would you turn your hymnals to 318?
Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want Thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every flow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, Lord, whiter than snow, and I shall find I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, look down from the throne in the skies and help me to make a perfect. myself and whatever I know. Now wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing, I see thy blood flow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, thou seest the patiently wait. Come now within me, a new heart create to those who have sought thee. Lord, thank you so much. We ask you, Lord, that you bless us as we leave. Go with us and protect us. Surround us, Lord, with your presence. We pray all these wonderful, wonderful things in your son's name. Amen.